is this gonna take? You know, it's okay, we can have them kinda one Splice them? Yeah, exactly. one one All right, you want some hemming and hawing to use as B-roll? That's all good, uh, yes. How did the concept for Infamous get started? How did you guys even start on this path? Well, we uh, we were rolling off Sly 3 in 2006, and you know we knew we wanted to work in with Sony. We love working with Sony. So we uh, basically split into small groups, and we each came up with a little pitch document. Here's a game we could build next. And this is the one that ended up turning into Infamous. We originally called it True Hero, Things changed a lot, you know, over the course of infamous development. But a lot of the stuff that we wanted to do at the beginning, you know, we ended up keeping. You know, that you're a, that you're a hero, that you're protecting a city, your powers develop over the course of the game. All that was there in the beginning. You just kind of have to know how to look for it. I got a regular slate. Ready? No. Yeah. The infamous series really is the story of Cole McGrath, and in Infamous One, he sort of begins his adventure as a bike courier, kind of an invisible person in Empire City, and he delivers a package that changes his life. It's some kind of a bomb, it's not really clear what it is, creates a great explosion in the city and kills a whole bunch of people. No! No! In the middle of it all, he's left alive, but his body's been changed and he's been given these crazy electrical superpowers. So all throughout Infamous One, he was trying to understand why he'd been selected for this, what's happening to his, his body and the city around him. And he learns at the end of it that it was all to prepare him for the, this coming monster, this, this horrible, horrible beast that is capable of destroying civilization. And he was told that he's the only one who can defeat it. So we start Infamous Two with that beast arriving and him trying to fight it and failing and then the game is all about gearing up for round two. This story finds us moving from Empire City down into the southeast of the United States and in a fictional city called New Marais. There he's gonna try and locate the source of the technology that built the device that exploded in Empire City in the first game and see if that can be used in some way to help enhance the abilities he has. Cole, as he goes through New Marais, is finding these things called blast cores. As he uses those, he gains more powers on his own. Pulse a current through it, and its energy will release into the nearest conduit. Whoa, so this is gonna make me stronger. The militia are called the protectors of New Marais, but really they're, they're kind of their own thing. Bertrand is the leader of the militia, and he wants everyone to think he's on their side, that he's helping them, but it's not clear if the solution is better than the problem in this case. Up there, freaks! <laughs> In the first game, we wanted to give you that sense of personally going through an origin story. And in this game, we're kind of having you go through the experience of owning the mantle of being a superhero, choosing it versus having to be thrust upon you. I think all of it's a sucker punch are gamers, and we want to make a really cool game because we love gaming, and nobody here is going to not play the game. It's a product of a lot of people's hard work and creativity, and they're, they're using their creativity to make things that they like and care about. I am super duper excited that we're at Comic-Con because uh, to me it's just like Popular culture, it is, that is it, man. The fact that, you know, we're in, invited to participate is a, is, a, is a big deal because it means we're part of popular culture and uh, if we have made the grade to be a part of it, then that's awesome. That means that we're, we're succeeding at making people happy with the game and that's totally our goal. It's huge going to panels and listening to people talk and stuff like that, it's gonna be really uh, cool to be like on the other side and finding out that there's there's enough people out there that really see Infamous as like this comic book come to life.
I think when we were doing the original Infamous, we, we knew we were doing superhero, but I don't think we wanted to do it in kind of super traditional superhero way. Like the first thing we'd have to tell people is, no, he doesn't wear tights or anything like that. It's like, what if it's a regular person who would get superpowers? It fit more into some of the kind of postmodern stuff, the feel of a modern city at, under, in crisis, kind of the dystopian books that had been out in the last 10 years, some really, really great stuff. The most direct influences on Infamous don't come from the comics I read growing up. It's from all the media that um, was influenced by those comics. It was kind of second generation stuff. So Batman movies, especially the recent Batman movies, have been um, a, a big influence for us because they have that sort of spirit of comics in them, but it's filtered through a modern, you know, up-to-day gestalt. You know, the city feels realistic. The characters are flawed. You know, I don't think we wanted to just say, well, here's this comic, let's just go make it um, and just change the character. You know, I don't think that that would have been a huge failure for us. So this is an honorable treatment of a comic hero. But with a hero that was really designed to make sense and be really fun in the context of a game, a game where you did have choices, important choices, which we always felt were part of becoming a superhero. Infamous was the first game we'd really made where we were making a game for ourselves in some sense. We have so many comic fans here. It was fun to make a game where you were really trying to do a game that people like you would enjoy. For me, it was uh, escapism. Yeah, you know, I grew up in a real small town. It is really tough to get this sense of bigness. Before I got into comics, I was into, you know, Bionic Man and Evil Knievel. There's something out there that you could you could turn it on and you kind of like have that level of escape. And like with comic books, it was definitely that. Uh, all the artists from the studio, we actually make a comic called uh, Atomic Lead. Uh, kind of quit comic for a while, but then kind of got the itch and I kind of start doing my own comic again. and you know, print up stuff and uh, Xerox, you know, fold it in half, staple it myself, take it to local comic convention. I think it definitely helps to have that love for that medium. And then you can kind of take that and, and apply what works and kind of discard the stuff that doesn't work. If you go back to the 1950s Spider-Man when he first started, the stuff is so ridiculous. He's having conversations with, with his enemies as he's fighting them, like between punches. Now, what I'm about to do to you is, and he's wearing underwear, you know, like this crazy. The powers are kind of the, the element that's still similar to comic books, but then we're trying to marry that with a realistic environment and an art style that makes it more believable to people who aren't necessarily huge comic book fans. But if you go too real, then some of the stuff that we're trying to do, you know, a guy having electricity powers and crazy supervillains, you know, then that doesn't work anymore. So you want to be in that space where that's believable. Real characters that have real problems, Peter Parker has to make rent. Bruce Banner has to actually deal with being a fugitive. And Tony Stark, you know, he's, a, he's an alcoholic, and that's the type of character that, you know, Cole is. We feel that people just related to him on a level that even we didn't expect. I think that the kind of the history of video games made out of existing heroes was one of the reasons we decided to go with an original IP. They've had a mixed bag. It has a whole bunch of expectations and limitations that have been built into its universe. You know, you take Superman as an example. The guy has unlimited power. I mean, if you're gonna build it out of that character, it's like, well, kryptonite harms him, but otherwise, what is he not gonna do, you know? Huh? It's very difficult to make a video game where that's really fun. Video games suck at that. They, they, they only succeed if they bind you into space, play space. In Infamous 2, you just basically have the expectations of staying true to the characters that you know you originally created. So you get to capture a lot of that rawness that you don't get when you're trying to stay true to an existing established character, you know. But here we get to just you know create what we want, which is awesome. But to really improve and get to the kind of the next level, be willing to throw away your old stuff and start over. There was a lot of splatter work done in the first one. I mean, literally every page was just a big wet splatter everywhere. And I felt that, that worked really well in an urban city. In Umurai, it just didn't seem like it would make as much sense, you know? I kind of wanted to capture a little bit more of what this New Orleans-ish kind of city would look like. So just kind of removing a lot of the wet splatters and going more for a watercolor look as opposed to uh, 
more traditional uh, comic book coloring. I've seen some graphic, uh, you know, cutscenes where, you know, when somebody hit them, it's like kapow, and you see the word kapow. The direct reference with the, the border or the panels uh, and the word balloons and stuff, it's really an element of the printed medium. Some of those things doesn't really apply. This is an evolution of, you know, taking something that printed and now seeing it, you know, in motion and with sound. Like all art form, it's always evolving, which is really exciting. Super, super exciting to be, you know, at that edge. And the, what we're doing is not a comic book, nor is it a straight, full-on, you know, animated piece. It's actually somewhere in between, and we're trying to carve that little niche. There's an experience that everybody wants to have, which is to be a superhero. If we can make a game that lets you be that superhero and, and own that, that experience, that's really my objective. And I think we are probably still the underdog, you know, of the whole thing. Uh, Marvel and DC and Batman, Sp uh, Spider-Man, all those guys have years and years of history of kind of ingrained into um, the, the modern culture. Um, so we're just trying to, you know, put our notch on it. Pushed out of the swamp and there she was, New Murray. Came here four years ago while learning how to climb. monsters are gonna get in my way. I say bring it. What do you get when you put together a renowned rock drummer, classical musicians, a southern funk band, an award-winning composer, and Sony Computer Entertainment? An unprecedented musical collaboration for the soundtrack to Infamous 2. The sequel to 2009's Infamous has main man Cole wielding brand new powers in a new city, New Moray. To amp up the ambience, the entire production crew trekked from the Bay Area down to New Orleans and back again to score Cole's moody new playground. This is New Moray, a swampy, devastated city overrun by mutants. If it looks familiar, that's because it's based on New Orleans, a city with a history of music and destruction. For SCEA music manager Jonathan Mayer, the backdrop was pure inspiration. You worked on the first Infamous game, so what are you doing different with this one? In Infamous 1, so much of the score was trying to express the personality of this amazing city that Sucker Punch had built for the game. As soon as we started discussing the new city with them, and of course the concept that it was based on New Orleans said so much to us musically right away, that we knew we had an immediate sort of like game changer. And a move away from Empire City's electronic bass rhythms. To nail a percussion heavy backbone with a funky southern twist, Jonathan recruited rock drummer Brain Mantia, who's played with everyone from Tom Waits to Guns N' Roses. New Orleans funk band Galactic were added to the mix for some global flavor. Bringing in the guys from Galactic and Brain was all actually pretty easy because they're all collaborative artists by nature. I listened to the old soundtrack and you know they said they wanted to get away from the electronic side and make it more organic. You know we've played a lot of video games over our lives and knowing that the game is kind of based loosely in a fictitious New Orleans kind of environment, we kind of knew what they were looking for from us. Bringing in the more classical elements are orchestrator Tim Davies and orchestral composer Jim Dooley. They both contributed to the first game soundtrack. We caught up with them during a recording session at Skywalker Ranch. Working on the second game presented its own new set of challenges aside from the first one. The first one, we wanted to do better than we did the first time. But translating Cole's heroic sacrifice better isn't exactly a stroll through the radioactive park. Under Jonathan's guidance, the musicians were forced to stretch their creative comfort zones. We started thinking, well, let's take real musical instruments and stuff like that and just make them sound weird and twisted and dark. Well, what we did um, with this is we worked with a, a small string group and, you know, with five players and close miking, 
and uh, you know, getting sort of really having them involved in the process, we were able to get you know, lots of unique sounds out of classical instruments. So it was just violin, viola, cello, and bass, but we kind of made them sound in a way like you know, distorted guitars. These cues that Jonathan would give us, which were just that, like cues that didn't have to be exactly this length, and and there was a certain amount of freedom built in there for us to just try and develop the sound that he was describing. In a funny way, it was kind of pick a bunch of wrong notes <laughs> and odd rhythms. It was heroic, but it was very distressed. So that's why when when I was making the per percussion sounds, I was really trying to. You know, I detuned a lot of them. I never tuned up when I had somebody play a bass or anything because that, that kind of dissonance is part of the game. They were just forced to sort of do things kind of wrong. We could build to that. That was hip. What's the rhythm of the game? The people in charge are digging the really brutal, and they kept using the word brutal. You know, I was like, brutal. Like, more brutal, big drum stuff. I'm like, okay, cool, I can do that. Like in Cole's first adventure, unconventional sounds required some unconventional techniques and instruments. Stuff like frying pans and just, you know, uh, mixing bowls, those kinds of things sprinkled around this nine dingy bass drum and different calfskin headed uh, drums that I've been collecting. And then we would start, you know, be hitting the strings with pencils. Tim started getting really creative with the kinds of direction he would put on the charts for these guys to play. Here we go. He came up with a direction that would be over, you know, certain parts that the guys were supposed to play uh, would say FWI on the score over them. Nobody wanted to be the guy that was like, what does this mean? And then finally someone did, and uh, Tim sort of looked at them like, you know, you should know this, and went, it means f with it. Pulling off a soundtrack with so many different musicians required some killer collaboration. The team would exchange bits and pieces of original music, building upon each other's work. For all the history of, of great tunes and orchestrations, like how, how do we do this in a new way? You need a good team to trust the, so that you can really, you can fail and move on with great success. The Sony guys would come down with string quartets that they had written or little pieces and say, okay, here's this. How about you do like a real brutal big drum thing to it? Okay, I'll do that. Okay, now how about you go and do like more of an ambient thing on the on the jungle bizarro kit. Like all of a sudden I'd hear something Galactic did or or Jim do you know and I'd be like, oh okay yeah I kinda already did something like that. That's cool. You know, we're all kind of just all kind of fit. All of the elements that they brought uh, to the table worked really well together and somehow complemented each other. There was a lot of interplay, a lot of ideas being thrown around. And and it was great that we had the time to experiment with that. We're good. Wow. Great. It's like a game of telephone almost. Telephone's a great uh, analogy because the way that things get sort of twisted and manipulated in a game of telephone, we wanted that to happen. You take the thing that this guy did and do your thing with it. How is songwriting for a video game different from just regular songwriting? It's very different actually to write for, for the game than it is to write for your own project. And it's very liberating in a way that we came up with stuff that, just by experimenting, we came up with stuff that we may never have thought of, just because we had complete freedom. It was very different than recording for the band. That was cool. For me, it was awesome because I got to experiment with, you know, so many different, like, rhythms, like some odd time ones. With Sony, it's great. We get away with experimenting a lot, and they want that. And sometimes you miss, but you're not gonna get in trouble for trying here, which is great. As it went, because I was like, they were digging it, saying, hey, keep going, keep experimenting. They were like, no one says that these days, you know? That's why it was so fun to do this. Some games use techniques that make their soundtracks and music more seamless. You know, they'll do it all in one key, all in one time signature. Right. You guys did not do that. No. I actually cringe when I hear stories like that. How to make that work in the context of the game and how to get from the piece of music that plays before that to the piece of music that plays after that and all those things. That's just more work for us to do, but it's work we relish and work we enjoy and it's work that needs to happen to really nail it. And from the sounds of it, they did. 
Since these super musicians scored Cole's journey, we had to ask, what superpower would they want? Flying. It would have to be some sort of super sax playing ability. Wow. I would like to be able to read people's minds. I'd like to have gills, like uh, Waterworld. I would like to be able to drink, you know, as much beer as I could possibly humanly consume without being drunk. I think probably like the, the cool geek answer for me would be telekinesis. I've always wanted to be telekinetic. Like I'll, you know, spend a, you know, a few minutes every day at my desk just trying to move things with my mind. Well, their telekinesis powers might need some work, but at least this set of talented musicians have one super skill down pat, creating a killer soundtrack for Cole's continuing saga.